Today on The Grave Talks, paranormal detective, Greg Lawson. Make me feel safe in my own skin. You hear me crying out when I'm silent. And nobody knows my stories like you do. Cause you help me write a new rhythm to own. You make me feel like I'll be alright then. Alright then. Greg Lawson has been involved in the world of professional law enforcement and investigation work for decades. Being able to view the world of the paranormal through a filter of a law enforcement professional gives him a very unique perspective. How often does the world of paranormal and mental health collide? Are the dead often involved in crimes and criminal investigations, even tragedies? Today, we hear about life from the perspective of the paranormal detective, Greg Lawson. I was five years old. And my brother, who was 12 years older than I was, I had a motorcycle. So he was 17 and he would take me on this little motorcycle on the back roads of, uh, of central Texas. And we would just drive around and look for um, old buildings, uh, old structures and cemeteries. And then he would take me around and, and basically just scare the crap out of me, right? He would, <laughs> he would, uh, we, we'd go to a, a cemetery, one specific cemetery that is my first memory uh, of paranormal, so to say, is uh, uh, Middle Fistville Cemetery in Austin, Texas, or North Austin. And we pulled up on the motorcycle, you know, we got out. And then typically, in, in, in his typical fashion, he would go around and read the tombstones and he would read the names and the dates and stuff like that and then he'd figure out how old the person was so his his goal was to go in the tomb uh, go into the cemetery and find the graves of children my age or younger and then scare me you know and and uh, and so it kind of it, it started like that uh shortly after that i was going to watch Frankenstein on TV. It was going to be on TV. And I'm, I'm going to watch Frankenstein. Well, my mom said, no, no, you're, you're, you're not going to watch Frankenstein. You're going to go to bed. And I threw a fit. You know, I cried. And she says, okay, you want to watch Frankenstein? Let's watch Frankenstein. So she sets the TV up, you know, back then. This, is, uh, this would have been 1970, I guess, 1968, 70, something like that. And... She goes in and makes the Jiffy Pop popcorn, you know, on the little metal <laughs> tin, the old style, yep. you know, where it blows up like a big hat. And uh, and I, I remember I, she gave me drip, jif, Jiffy Pop popcorn and some sort of orange soda, probably Orange Crush. Mm -hmm. And I sat and I watched Frankenstein and it terrified me. Right. And that night I had the you know the terrifying dream of the blonde lady coming to get me i'm not sure where the blonde lady came from but anyway it, it was kind of like a um, old hag experience you know i'm a little kid and mm -hmm. this this thing is on top of me holding me down in the bed and i'm trying to get up you know and and so that's that's kind of where it all started i was about i was i was about five years old and uh and it, it, for me, it was just natural. Growing up in, in in elementary school, what did I do? I went and got my friends, and I would go, "Hey, let's go find the cemetery. Hey, let's go find the you know, do urban exploration, go through old buildings, go through you know, uh, a anything odd or weird." Mm -hmm. uh, but that was my normal. So sure, I I, I understand. I, I think I did a lot of the same things <laughs> uh, yep. as far as getting out there, and I I, I personally would wander around a cemetery. Uh, I'm a child who grew up in the 80s uh, and Ghostbusters was quite big. So I would have my, my proton pack on and I'd be wandering around the local cemetery busting <laughs> ghosts. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> while these individuals are grieving over, you know, Aunt Bernice. You know, it's like, I got Bernice. Yeah. And they're like, get back here, you little. Yeah. So um, that um, I understand. It, it, it was normal. It, it's only yeah. like years later you look back and go, oh, that was uh, that was kind of odd. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, very interesting a lot of this it sounds like initially was based on you know on, on paranormal fantasy on 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 pop culture of of movies and things of that nature and the the spooky idea and the feeling that ghosts gave you or visiting environments that that had a, a spooky lore to them well, when, it, it, that that's very true and and to 
um, compile on that mm -hmm. is I was raised Catholic. Mm -hmm. So I have this, um, these, this credo that I was raised with that is, um, if you look at it, it's pretty terrifying. And, um, it, it, I, I, my godmother sent me the sacred heart picture of Jesus. If you've never seen it, go online, mm -hmm. uh, sacred heart picture of Jesus, look it up. And it's Ted Nugent with his heart hanging out of his chest. That's what it is to, to, to a little kid, you know, I'm, I, and I had this, this painting on my wall in my bedroom of this dude with long hair and his heart hanging out. And, and man, that thing, you know, and his eyes followed you, you know, wherever you went, Sure, it was, it was absolutely terrifying. So, you know, a, as a child growing up, you're told what your reality is mm -hmm. and your experiences, you know, um, kind of add to that. But, you know, that, that's, that's why I affectionately say this, uh, it'll probably be on my tombstone. It'll probably say Catholic, you know, I, but I consider myself a recovering Catholic. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I, I understand. Yeah. I mean, so, so you have these experiences and, and, and you just naturally kind of feel this excitement, this joy, you're drawn to this, this topic, this idea. Was it, was it real for you as far as maybe ghosts really do exist at that moment, even though you really didn't have a, a paranormal experience at that moment in time? Or was it more so, I'm curious if this exists, and I don't really care if it does or not. I just like the feeling of being spooked out. You know, it's a little bit of all of that. Yeah. Uh, I, I sit back and, and, and think about, you know, uh, what I was taught, you know, like the Ten Commandments and, yeah. uh, uh, you know, as a child, you assume that other people believe what you believe because that's your belief and you don't, you know, have that much experience in uh, in other people's opinions and, and all that. Uh, but it, that kind of uh, guides your interpretation of the world, I guess. And, and, and you get that through your five senses, you know, touch, taste, hearing, smell and sight uh, and maybe, uh, you know, a sixth sense like a, a, a your your internal clock sense of time or your intuition about how things make you feel mm -hmm. and it's it's uh it, it, it's a very I, I think it can be a very confusing thing and uh but uh, so i i i firmly believe there's something else and i and i do that i'm a scientific materialist i've i've, I've been in law enforcement uh 28 years or something like that and so i operate on a, a level of um you know I, I want some fact here that can lead me to getting an indictment through a grand jury so that's the way i look at the paranormal is what is some really compelling evidence that uh, something is happening and, you, you know, the funny thing is, is, is a lot of uh, paranormal investigators, a lot of ghost hunters, they go in uh, with a specific thing in mind and they follow that track as opposed to following the real evidence and, and interpreting the real evidence. And um, so I, I uh, <laughs> that's kind of where I come from. I believe that if you're investigating the paranormal, how can you use normal means to do so? Mm -hmm. we're, we're looking for paranormal other than normal, something different. And so if we're, if we're using gadgetry that is detecting certain things, um, well, that's normal. So maybe, uh, we're already equipped with our brains and our experience, our soul, our spirit, whatever it is to interpret this stuff. And I, I so I, I travel all over Europe and all over the United States and I do different ghost tours and, and I, I do ghost hunts and I, you know, I'm on the lecture circuit and I watch people fly to, let's say Britain and they spend a lot of money to stay at really cool places and they spend 90% of their time looking at their phone or their gadget while they're walking around in the dark in some, you know, castle. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, put your gadgets down, have the experience, let yourself have that experience. Let your, your mind, you know, your, your eyes and your ears and everything be a part of it. Not just 
you know whether the 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 light turns green or not so let's go back uh, to your childhood or wherever this may may fall in your timeline of where you actually did have an initial run-in with something that in fact you look back on and go maybe that was paranormal or maybe you're quite sure it was paranormal you're like damn that was paranormal what what was that for you so the first thing would be and 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 it in, in my opinion, it's paranormal. Sure. It's a, a, I, I saw um, one of like a, a Thunderbird, I guess. Um, I saw a giant bird and I was once again, I'm five years old. I'm across the street playing with a friend. We're under this huge, beautiful weeping willow tree and we're playing, doing something. And I had to go back home. And so I walk away. My friend goes inside his house. I'm walking across his yard. I walk down this little hill to the street. I step out on the street from underneath that that weeping willow. And a bird flew over me, kind of swooped and flew over me. And his wingspan was the span of the road. And it's, too, you know, like a regular uh, two-lane asphalt road. Yeah. And it scared the you know everything out of me it it was terrifying and i ran and i ran and told my mom and my mom's like oh no it's just probably a buzzard i know i i remember this and i talked to my mom my mom passed uh, last year and i had talked to, uh, to her a few years ago about it and she's like yeah i remember when you when you did that cuz cuz i was so scared and she tried to you know calm me down and made me a little sandwich and you know but i was really freaked out and, uh, and so she remembered that also. And in my mind, in this five-year-old's mind, you know, my perception could have, could have been off, you know, the, as a child, it's, you know, spatial time and, and all, all that, it, it, it could have been off, but it was vivid to me how big he was and what he looked like. It was, it wasn't like a buzzer. It was more like a big hawk. You know, like a big eagle, and it could have been a, a, an eagle. There are eagles, uh, believe it or not, uh, in Texas, and they're they're a little west of where I live, about 20 miles. I guess one could have made it over there then, and just been really rare. But anyway, it was huge. Mm-hmm. It scared the heck out of me. It's interesting when you have those experiences as a child, and then you you try and and review them as an adult. And I know our memory can be be very uh, inaccurate uh, as far as how we recall things. You're essentially rebuilding it every time you're recalling it. And sometimes that can be very fallible. But yes, sometimes yes. we just, you know, you just know what you saw. <laughs> yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and it's interesting you bring that up because a, a lot of people really don't understand our senses. I mean, we, we know, okay, I hear, I feel, I, I smell, I can taste, and I can see. But there's a lot more to it than that. And the, and the simple fact is, for instance, just, just to go down this rabbit trail for a second. Yeah. For instance, we're all blind. We really don't see. People, people are like, well, I can see what's in front of me right now. No, you don't. Uh, the way your eye is constructed, it's constructed of rods and cones. And all it's designed to do is pick up, pick up the electromagnetic spectrum. And that's a huge spectrum. And the only part we can see is the visual spectrum right in the center, right? Mm-hmm. And what's happening is I'm taking in this this electromagnetic spectrum into these senses we call eyeballs, and then it's transformed into electrical and chemical responses, and it goes to the back of my brain, and the back of my brain receives it and then has to interpret what it believes it sees. So you're, you, it, what, you're exactly right. You... Every time you see something, every time you experience something, your brain is constructing that as kind of an icon on how to navigate your uh, your environment. And I'm sitting in front, you know, I'm I'm, I'm sitting at a desk, and, and it, it it looks, you know, wood. I interpret it as wood. It's hard. I can't put my hand through it. Um, that's the way I interpret it. It's it's very similar to an icon on a desktop. You know, that icon on your desktop is not Microsoft Word. It's an icon to go into a whole bunch of ones and zeros that are, are uh, formed in a way that can make an interpretation of what you're trying to, to uh, communicate. Mm-hmm. 
So that's that's really neat. If you sit and and think about that for a minute and think that, you know, I, I believe what I see in front of me is a microphone and a, and a computer. But what's really there, you know, I, I don't know whether the the eyes are a lens to the to to the soul. It's uh, there's a lot of interpretation going on in our brain right now when we're trying to do this. And you know, pareidolia throws you know, go, goes in there. Um, you know, where where your visual perception picks up patterns where no patterns exist. But we're designed to do that for fight or flight and for survival to 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 recognize what is danger and what's friendly. So yeah, it's, it's, it gets really confusing, especially for witnesses of witnesses or quote unquote experience experiencers of some sort of paranormal event. Um, it gets really weird for you when an individual has a paranormal experience. Uh, and let's say there's a group of people uh, out there and in a handful or just a few uh, in the group, maybe one in the group said, you know, swears to God, they saw something in great detail some of the others in the group, they didn't see it, but they they heard something uh, and and saw something move that seemed to be in tandem with the the clear uh, entity or, or or object there that was moving around, uh, and others felt odd, and then some felt absolutely nothing. Um, when you have that, do you believe it's just like our other senses? Some of us can pick up on on certain frequencies audibly. Uh, better than others, just you know, like our, our pets can do such things. Do you believe us as humans are in that same sort of a, a boat where some of us are able, are more sensitive in that area to, to see things and to sense things that are of what we would call and consider the paranormal when really they're, they're truly part of our environment. It really is normal. It's paranormal because not very few people are, are in that spectrum. But uh, but that is really what is going on here. Some are just more sensitive to it than others. Absolutely, yes. Uh, the the answer to that question <laughs> for, for me is yes. Yeah, I, I uh, I've been around a, a whole bunch of different people. I you know I I, uh, I worked as a homicide investigator, as a as a uh, a hostage negotiator, and as a mental health officer that uh, investigates people that have strange experiences and determines whether or not they need to go to you know a mental hospital or not. So. I, I have um, more than the average person's uh, uh, experience in dealing with those types of things, and you know, it, it, it's it's pretty apparent that there are, are people that are much more in tuned to their intuition or their gut instinct or you know uh, whatever the thing is that they interpret. Uh, gives them information above and beyond what everybody else gets and, and interprets it above and beyond uh, what a, uh, the average person would do. And the, 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 the problem with a lot of that is, is, is we're our own worst enemy. We can trick ourselves better than anybody else can trick us. And the individuals, you know, I, I've had plenty of people say, oh, you know, have you have you ever seen a ghost? And I'm like, no, I don't I don't think I have I'm like, well, you're just probably not open to the experience. I'm like, well, I've been I've been running around doing this for 50 years. So, um, man, I suck. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I've, I've, I've ran into some really interesting experiences. Uh, we, we had a uh, I was over in Ireland. Uh, we went to Lep Castle in Ireland, and uh, 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 Dave Schrader of uh, the Halser Files was was with us. Sure. And <laughs> we had this great experience. We go in, and I, I write that uh, I write about this experience in my uh, my latest book, The uh, Diaries of the Paranormalist. I we we went to Lep Castle. Let let me back up just a second, real quick. Yeah. The we're driving around in Ireland. I'm, I'm with this little group and we're just having a good time driving around and they're like, hey, let's go to Lep Castle. And I was like, hey, what's Lep Castle? And the place went silent. And everybody turned around to me like I was a, <laughs> the biggest idiot in the room, you know? And they're like, you don't know what Lep Castle is? I was like, no, I've never heard of it. And they're like, you're, you're, and I use air quotes again, the paranormal detective, and you don't even know what Lep Castle is. You know, what kind of qualifications do you have? <laughs> and I was like, oh, I just don't know about Lep Castle. I don't, I don't know. 
Lep Castle was the most incredible experience I've had. Uh, going there and meeting the owners and, you know, just uh, letting them, them letting us go into their house, their home and, and go wherever we wanted to go. And I, I spent uh, probably about 90 percent of my time in the bloody chapel in the, in the top of the uh, of Lep Castle itself. And there's plenty of murders there. I mean, it was just it, the craziness that happened there was just beyond it. it they were all serial killers. All those people we're, we're serial killers and it's just incredible. Anyway, so I spent all this time up there and I took a whole bunch of pictures. I got pictures of me standing there with hundreds of orbs all around me. And, you know, uh, people are, are, are amazed by that. And I'm like, yeah, I would be amazed too. But that was one of the most dusty places on the planet. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, I was stationed in the Sinai Desert for six months. So I, I am qualified to say that. <laughs> sure. So I, I uh, we get through and then we go down and talk to Sean, the uh, the owner, and uh, he's a musician. He plays a song for us, tells us a couple of uh, of the ghost stories there. And then we, we leave. We walk out. We're walking across the, the lawn. Everybody's taking pictures, having a great time. Um, turned around, took a picture. And a, a friend of mine, Tammy Cody, was, was standing there. And she took a picture of me, Dave, and, uh, um, uh, and Eric. And we left. Well, a couple of days later, we're all looking at the photo and, and was like, what in the world is that? And up in the uh, second story window, it, it looks like a priest or a bishop standing in that window. And we had just come down from there. And it, 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 one of the one of the, the legends there, oh, it's not a legend. This is a pretty much historical fact that a brother killed his 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 other brother there in the the bloody chapel and his in his the brother that was murdered was the priest for the clan not kkk clan sure. i'm talking about the, <laughs> the the clan over there yeah their their family clan and so you know I, I looked at this picture i'm like that is why i spend thousands of dollars to go do stuff is just this one little hint of something different something paranormal something metaphysical whatever it is and and anyway so that's uh, i i absolutely uh have my fingers crossed and believe that there is something there's something else at work around us i mean that sounds like a, a great experience as far as getting some validation uh for, for you know the the adventure or the the hunt to see what was over there and to see if there was in fact something in the castle obviously many many people have their evidence but it is one thing when you go in yourself and see it and experience it firsthand let me go back a little bit and, and let's talk about your work uh as a professional with with the mental health field and investigating situations there what sort of situations would you run into where an individual claimed to have a paranormal experience uh and this is kind of a, a and or the other or, or, or really let's hear both sides of this uh, where you believed yes in fact they legitimately had a paranormal experience others are looking at this as a mental health problem and then what were some of the experiences where they claim but then upon further investigation no you really should get some help for for whatever is going on well you know the we we get mental health units or, or like critical what's typically called a critical incident team is uh, a group of cops they don't wear uniforms typically and um they get called out on anybody who's uh, committing or, or threatening to commit suicide or having suicide or having delusions or ideations of, of something that uh, is, is absolutely not normal. And so this typically uh, comes in the form of some sort of disturbance happening someplace. Cops get called there. They get there. They realize this person is having cognitive issues and then they call a CIT member. CIT member comes out. And then interviews the person and determines whether they meet criteria, which is, are they suffering from some sort of mental illness and are they a danger to themselves or others? And if you answer that, then you basically put them in protect protective custody, take them to somebody to evaluate. 
well, you know, these things can can fall into kind of um, uh, their own categories. So you, you have your alien abduction, uh, alien experience, UFO kind of category. You have uh, your demonic category. And you have um, some sort of, let's say, um, intelligence agency category like the FBI, CIA, NAS, you know, w- whatever it might be that this person's having a delusion about. So you get called out there. Now, the, the most compelling ones that I ever worked uh, were the alien abduction seminar. I mean, the, the alien abductions situations. And you go out and talk to somebody and, you know, the stories range from, yeah, it, it's, it, it has a very broad range. But there's certain characteristics of the story that everybody has. And, and that would be, you know, bright light, um, lots of pain. They're uh, experimenting on your body, sticking things in your body, uh, and, and that sort of thing. And being on a spaceship, not being, mo- being able to move, um, uh, they can look around and see it, some things, but, you know, it, it's, it's all kind of foggy. I, I've always um, taken those, uh, those reports pretty seriously because you, you really don't know what's happening. That, that could have been somebody drugged them at the bar and took them back to their basement someplace and, and had their way with them and then dumped them where we found them sure. or whatever. So you now people, I, I was helping out and I, most of the investigations that I do, um, I, I'm very selective about it. You know, in, in, in law enforcement, if you're a detective and you work uh, GAD detail, general assignments detail, you're going to get cases like, uh, you know, slashed tires with no uh, suspect information. Uh, you know, a, a, a damaged mailbox with no leads of who might have done it. And, you know, just a whole bunch of little things, right? And you can take 70 cases like that a month mm-hmm. and, and effectively, you know, contact the victim and say hey do you have any other information okay well i don't have any information Uh, i don't see anything that correlates in your neighborhood that this was an ongoing thing looks like it's isolated you know if we come up with something we'll call you back otherwise i'm going to suspend the case and you suspend the case you move on i listen to paranormal investigators that that will sit and say yeah you know i've i've done 700 ghost investigations and i'm thinking what (laughs) How in the world did you do that? Uh, I might do two a year, but in those two, I'm, I'm working with people who one don't want to be on camera. They don't want to have, you know, any publicity. They're they're um, they, they they work in government or they own their own business or they're on, you know they they're active in their church and they just don't want to have anything else. You know, to, to 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 look down upon them. They don't sure. they don't want that because that's that's the way a lot of people look at it. If you say, yeah, you know, I have a ghost in my house. People just kind of roll their eyes and like, oh, really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe you need some medication. My point is, just because somebody needs medication, just because someone uh, is diagnosed with a mental illness, it doesn't mean they weren't abducted. Mm-hmm. So when you're doing an investigation, when I'm doing an investigation or uh, uh, dealing with someone who has mental illness and reporting an alien abduction, well, you can't just roll your eyes and go, yeah, this guy's crazy. You know, let's take him to the hospital. You need to to follow that trail a little bit and and see if something actually did happen. Uh, And when we're doing our investigations like that, today, it's, it's pretty... It's a little bit simpler today because of cell phones and because of cameras and that sort of thing everywhere. You know, if somebody's downtown and they said that they had this, well, there's going to be multiple cameras that they walk by in different areas. And, you know, you can you can support uh, their assertions of what happened or you can dismiss their assertions of, of what happened based on what you pull off of their cell phone, what you can uh, uh, get off of video and, and of course, you know, third party witnesses and things like that. So yeah, that those are the big ones that really intrigue me the most. The, the, the ones dealing with demonology and, and possession. I, 
I dealt with quite a few of those. Uh, quite a few of those were drug induced. Mm -hmm. And once again, okay, just because somebody took drugs, does that mean that they're not, you know, um, uh, possessed? Well, maybe that's what made them take the drugs uh, to, you know, because they were possessed and, and, and they're making really poor life choices at that point. So, you know, you have to look at that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and, and of course, then, you know, like I said, the, the CIA, FBI kind of thing of, uh, I worked one, one time that, um, uh, I was talking to this guy and he, he wasn't really a danger to himself, but he believed that the CIA was watching him and had put, uh, these little robots on his dog. So I go and look at his dog and we're, we're looking for the robots. And sure enough, there's a whole bunch of little creatures crawling around on his dog. They're called fleas. But, you know, his interpretation was, well, yeah, they look like fleas, but they're actually robots. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, okay. So um, I felt really bad about it because he had, I, I had talked to uh, a lot of his, his fan or his family and some of his friends. And they said, yeah, he's, he's always believed that. That's what's going on. You know, that's, that's just him. He, he exists like this, and it's fine. And so that's, he's, that's, he's not a danger, you know. Um, but uh, about a month later, we get a call, and he ended up, yeah, not treating his dog well because of these robots. And so, um, you know, there are actions that people will take above and beyond uh, based on their gut feeling or, or their interpretation on something that, you know, uh, can be flawed. That wraps up part one of our interview and conversation with Greg Lawson, the paranormal detective. In part two, we'll ask Greg what sort of evidence Greg has come across when investigating claims of the paranormal and mental health problems. How does modern unknown culture influence what people assign as their paranormal experiences? Does Greg believe that any specific category or organization of building or structure may hold more paranormal energy than others. And what happened when a family contacted Greg to investigate a case where a family believed their daughter had a very real imaginary friend? All that and more in part two of our conversation. Until next time for The Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening. Let me feel safe in my own skin You hear me crying out when I'm silent Cause you help me write a new